Today I'm at Mazak, I'm at their European headquarters in Worcester, I'm with Brian Edmondson and we're going to be talking about this machine behind me which is available from stock. Uh, probably a good place to start Brian, uh, maybe just talk us through briefly this machine, what it does. This is our Hyper Quadrex 250 MSY, it's a twin spindle, twin turret lathe, it has uh, up to 80mm bar capacity, it's um, on both spindles. What about the Y-axis, because that's an important aspect on these two, isn't it? Yeah, this one's quite unique in the way that we have the same Y-axis stroke on the top as we do on the bottom. That's something that's an enhancement that we've made and on this what, particular what model. what is that as a dimension? Plus minus 50, so 100 mil in total. Okay, does that mean really that we could draw a line, sort of a diagonal line, and mean that we've, we've really got two machines? Yeah, that's right. It's okay. Two machines back to back. Now, there'll be thousands of people watching this eventually. Don't want to put you on the spot or make you nervous in any way, shape or form. But what we want to find out is, of those people that are watching, who, who would be interested in this machine? Who would be a perfect fit for you? Who would you want to be watching what we're talking about now that this technology could really fit with? I think when we engage with our customers, we're looking to identify what those hotspots are that are going to make their production better. So the type of customers that would be interested in this machine are the type of customers looking for versatility, flexibility, um, with ideally good production runs for this particular type of machine where you can really optimise that process. One of the characteristics of this is not just that it's two machines back to back, but it's two turrets that can work simultaneously on the same spindle. So rather we do another machine that is um, like two machines back to back called a multiplex. This allows you to do balance your operations from your first operation, transfer across to your second op, and so you can have both spindles working independently of the turrets all together. That's, that's an interesting point. We'll talk about the balancing um, a little bit later in this interview. One of the things when I was reading the specification, um, I, I, I read about the weight. It's 15 tonnes, this machine, with an 80mm um, bar capacity capability. Therefore, the, the, the kind of markets and the applications that this could fit, is there any, is there any areas that you could identify, maybe you know, the medical sector, maybe the hydraulics industry. Who is, who is a perfect user for this particular machine? What industries? I don't think there's one specific user because we supplied this to subcontractors that have done anything from aluminium components right up to exotic stainlesses, ink canals, valve machining, for instance, is one particular application I can think of. So it's not specific to the material, but you're right with the 15 tons, it's a really rigid machine platform. So it's built with rigidity with that in mind. So it's capable of doing the lighter weight metals, but also the more difficult, hard to shift metals. And, and not just the weight, the power, I mean, 35 horsepower on not just the, the, the front, but the, the sub spindle as well. Um, what I wanted to also ask you is, it's quite an interesting debate we often have about these machines really being for high volumes. Now there's no question, people watching this will look at this machine and they'll go, this, this is a high volume machine, it is. Um, but as machine tool manufacturers evolve, they try and make machines fit into as many broad markets as they can to give them more options to sell. Um, what would you say if I asked you, or if I came to you with a low volume request, maybe 40 off, 50 off, 100 off, is this machine still going to give me a return on investment for that? It comes down to the nature of your parts, but yeah, you're right, it is aimed at, I think if you've got high volumes, high runners, there's some serious efficiencies to be gained. But we've also, like I said, had applications where the volumes have been similar numbers to what you're talking about. But the complexity and the, the number of tools that are involved in that particular job, that's what lends itself to this. Because sometimes when we're presented with a component, we've got to try to identify the best machine for that particular process. So when you come into a lathe, we're limited with the 12 station turret or sometimes on a 16 station turret on our standard lathe, but we're not quite into multitasking Integrex type machines, but we need a lot of tools and it's when cycle time is quite a high priority, that's where this machine really fits. So this is quite interesting because what you're saying is a, 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 somebody will present to you a component and the first thing you'll look at is how many tools you need to really machine that part in one operation. And if, that's, if, if you need more tools, then that's when you start looking at this technology. It's not about the volumes really to start with, is it? It's about the complexity of the part and getting it off in one hit. You're absolutely right, yeah. That will determine the type of machine platform that, that is suitable for that part or that range of parts. So the tooling does, it's quite a high um, 
plays quite a significant part in this machine. Because you've got the 12 stations up and lower, you can also have 24 index position. So, and with the y-axis that you've got upper and lower, means that you can utilize the tools in, in a different way. So there's no compromise between having to use the upper turret and the lower turret. They're essentially the same. So let's assume that we're going to be doing high volumes. Let's assume that we're going to buy this machine for big, long runners. When that happens, these three aspects I'm going to be looking at here. Firstly is the speed. Secondly is the balancing of the operation, which I suppose does come into the speed because it makes the part quicker. And thirdly is the reliability of the process, running it unmanned. Let's start with the speed, Brian. What makes this machine, in your opinion, faster than others on the market of this nature? I think I draw your attention to the control. The processing speed of the control is the fastest on the market. So in terms of taking your code and turning it into motion, that, that is a, a big win for Mazak. Well, I did read again on the, the specification, this control can process up to 540 meters of code a minute. I mean, that's just phenomenal. Incredible. Yeah. That's a hungry control. So it's a hungry control and you've got to keep it. You've got to keep it going. It means the complexity of your parts isn't going to slow down the machine. The machine's capable of, of processing that data and producing a very complex part so in a short only, time. And you're only as strong as your weakest link, and the control certainly isn't a weak link then. So what about the hardware here? What, you know, what have you done to make this machine move fast enough to be able to you know, spit that amount of code through to the machine to make parts? Well, we use linear guides, for one, so we've got increased speed with that. Uh, we've got 0.2 of a second index between the tool positions. We've got 24 different positions as well. Um, so that turret then, 0.2 seconds of an index, is that a just a straight index? Yes. So yeah. that's your, you don't have to push out, move to position and then reclamp. It's just a straightforward index. Um, one of the things, I, I was doing a podcast with a colleague yesterday and we were talking about how machines are made. And we were looking at things like, you know, the, the slant bed construction. Is it 45 degrees? Is it 60 degrees? Uh, we were talking about all kinds of aspects, you know, whether you use box guideways, linear rails. All of those things, the, the thermal compensation element. Um, how do you, what, what do Mazak do in order to, to make this machine be able to run unmanned for long periods of time and still maintain those tight tolerances? All of those things, everything that you mentioned is all what plays a big part. But this isn't a new concept for Mazak. We've had this particular machine for a lot of years, so it's a well-established machine platform. But when you look at the design now, it is a slant bed design. That's in particular to get rid of the amount of material that we're removing. We've got temperature control, we've got a series of sensors that are scattered around the machine that are accounting for the, the variation in different temperature and cutting conditions. Um, the so reliability. would you see a difference from the start of the day to the end of the day when you're running or is the idea to make sure that you're consistent throughout? It is about consistency, it's about consistently delivering high accuracy components. A balance turning, you mentioned this earlier, I'm very interested in this. Uh, this basically means, for those that don't know, you're able to, to rough and finish at the same time? You can do. I mean, when you talked about the, the high volumes and how we can really optimise that, this is because we can utilise both turrets on one particular spindle. So if your operations don't match ideally, then this allows you to compensate for that. So essentially, if you've got the right component, you're getting your second operation for nothing, and that's what really, really justifies the investment and I suppose I started this question by saying, is it the fastest machine in the market in your opinion? When you come up against your competition, you do cycle time, um, cycle time studies, which I'm sure happens on some of these machines. Do, do you find that some of these points you mentioned do make this machine make the part faster? Does that happen? It's surprising that when we look at this type of component, and you've already mentioned sliding head machines, the difference isn't as big as, as what people have that perception that it is. Because that's another point, isn't it? The sliding head lathe market is progressing. They're making their machines bigger. They're making their machines heavier, more powerful, bigger bar diameters. Is it reasonable for me to suggest that they're beginning to encroach on this market? Or would you say that this is a completely different animal? I think this is what's going to take you to the next level. When you start to look at the, the bigger components, the, the tougher materials, for instance, and you've got a lot of power on these, you've got 35 horsepower on each spindle. So that is... Um, that's a lot of capability right there, and that put, puts it into a slightly different bracket to sliding head machines. What about um, the very fact this machine's here available from stock? Um, what would reassure someone that was interested that you're not only 
supplying a great product here, but you're able to support it. You've got a lot of experience in this area, right? I think a lot of people buy into Mazak because of the whole infrastructure around what we do. We're not just a reseller of machines, we supply the whole shooting match in terms of the aftercare, the support. We've got a team of 25 application engineers that will work with our customers to really get the most out of the investment and to support our customers going forward. Is this an ideal opportunity for an engineer to relook at how they're making those maybe more complicated parts and consider something that can do them in one hit? I think it absolutely is. I think with the way the world's been over the last six months, a lot of people have been able to reassess how they do their, how they do their machining and how they can really introduce some efficiencies going forward when the market really picks back up. Good stuff. There you go. Available from stock. You can come and see it here safely at their European headquarters in Worcester. Uh, this is the Hyper Quadrex at 250 MSY. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you, Paul.